Hi, everybody. We have a really fun show today. We're going to be talking with Paul Hynek, who is the son of Alan Hynek. Now, this might sound familiar to you because a few weeks ago, I did a show with Paula Harris on the new History Channel uh, television series called Project Blue Book. And the backstory of that is Plot Project Blue Book was quite real. Um, the central player in it, um, the person they focus on throughout is Alan Hynek, who was an astronomer and a professor who was recruited uh, by the military into Project Blue Book to investigate the nature of sightings and contact, close encounters of the first, second, and third kind, and then determine what the, pu what the report would say, thus what the public would be told about them. Well, Paul is his son. And he lived in those days with all of this going on, is going to be talking about it. He's also one of the consulting producers uh, for the television show. So we're going to get behind the scenes and find out more about Alan Hynek and Project Blue Book. So without further ado, hi, Paul. Hi, how are you, Regina? I'm good. I know you're over at Paula Harris's place right now. So I could, because I recognize her in the, this in the background. Of course, Paula is kind of the central clearinghouse of this community. She knows everybody who knows everybody. So I'm glad we had a chance to catch you while you were in Boulder. Uh, first of all, I think a lot of people would like to know um, if this is, it, as a little kid coming up through this, were you, were you aware um, of what your father was up to? And then we'll start talking about your life and some other subjects in a moment. Okay, yeah, you know, uh, I'm asked about what it was like uh, growing up with UFOs, basically. And for us, it was Tuesday night. It was just normal. You know, however you grow up, whether you come to realize it was good or bad, is normal to you at the time. Right. So what was normal to us was UFO and flying saucer ornaments on the Christmas tree, <laughs> big mysterious spheres that were kicking around. Uh, a portrait of Travis Walton being zapped by a beam from a UFO oh, yeah. in our utility room and, and all kinds of UFO witnesses coming to the house, uh, discussions with other professors, yay and nay about the UFO phenomena. So that's just what was normal for us. So it was, a, it was completely integrated into your everyday life to talk about it. Your dad didn't try to keep anything secret from the kids. It's like, hey, this is something worth exploring for all of us, right? Yeah, and you know, and my father, first and foremost, was a scientist who was an astronomer by trade. Yes. That was his day job. And UFOs was a part-time job that kind of came out of the blue that grew to define him in a lot of people's eyes. But most of our conversations were about science in general, and then many of them would sort of narrow down to UFOs. So how, as a kid, how do you remember your father uh, – you know, coming into a coherence with this topic. Um, and then we're going to get into the show and how it's portrayed in the show a little later. Let's talk about the organic real thing first. Is how did your father as a scientist help look at this and explain things to you kids? Yeah, so, I, you know, the, the journey he went on was basically he started off as a confirmed debunker that thought this was all a bunch of post-war bunkum that the flying saucer paranoia would quickly fade away. And I think much to his scientific chagrin, it did not. And even though he's, you know, an astrophysicist and astronomer, and he had not unlimited, but, you know, copious resources from the Air Force, they couldn't explain them all. And, you know, the final verdict of Project Blue Book, which really was set up, especially after the Robertson panel in 1953, to debunk and solve cases, of the 12,000 cases they took on, 700 were unexplained. And that's, that's official numbers from Blue Book. Now, of those 12,000, of the other ones that were explained, many of them were, had bogus explanations, but they still threw their hands up in the air about 700. So my father, seeing this over time, kind of like a frog in hot water, came to realize that he couldn't explain them all. And as a scientist, unlike the military, whose job is national security, his job is just to sort of call it as he sees it. Now, we all start off as humans with preconceptions, and his was that there was nothing there. But over time, he came to realize there was something there. And I don't think he went from a debunker to a believer, because that's not really a word that scientists would use. He went from a debunker, a debunker to an acceptor of the phenomena. So by the time I came online and was conscious and 
woke, let's say, to these matters, he was already a confirmed acceptor of the phenomena, um, having gone through the cases and, you know, the Lonnie Zamora case was when he particularly liked and cited as one of the sort of signal turning points for him. Um, so by that time, he was a confirmed uh, acceptor of the phenomena and would talk about it in terms of wanting to lay out a classification system and an understanding and get other scientists to give it the attention that it merited. Yeah, that was very, um, very brave of him uh, in a time when it wasn't popul a popularly held belief and right. the pressures being applied. Did he really, uh, in the show, it shows he's under constant pressure from the military. Kill this story. Go to the town meeting. Make the people believe that they're, they didn't see what they saw. I mean, to me, I think watching the show, that's the part that is the most painful, is to have ordinary people who've had an astounding experience told that their eyes were wrong and deceived them. They didn't experience what they experienced. So in, in this particular case, did your dad indicate that he did have that kind of pressure on him to make it just a rational, earthly uh, explanation? Uh, th there was... I mean, clearly the institutional impetus of Project Blue Book was to explain things away. Mm -hmm. uh, but the show, as they do, they dramatize quite a lot, and we can talk more about that. We will, yeah. But, you know, they really dramatize the sort of, um, you know, nefarious scheming behind him and these generals that may have to deal with the problem um, and forcing him to do things. I mean, he was... I would say influenced and intimidated sometimes to trot out explanations, but that didn't last very long because he's a scientist and you know, he would only go so far. And you, you raised a good point, Regina. I mean, my father would often say of cases that he believes, the witnesses believe that they had a genuine experience. As a scientist, you can't often say, unless there's radar corroboration or other things, that something did happen. Now he would use that terminology not to impugn the credibility of the witness, but just to say, look, I can't say that it happened, I wasn't there, but I believe they believe they had a genuine experience. And as such, he was very empathetic to the trauma that this caused, not just the hours or, or minutes of a sighting, but the maybe months and years of sort of, let's say, call it a psychic scarring that they endured afterwards. And so he would never want to make light of that or try to cram some explanation that didn't work down their throats. Um, now, the Air Force obviously wanted to do that. So there was some opposition. But again, they really played it up in the show. Uh, the character that he plays directly with, um, who he explores and, and uh, examines cases with, was he did he, was this person real number one and did he if this person is real did they ultimately really come more into a relationship with the notion of science and what your father's trying to do or did they stay loyal to the military it's a really good question regina and i think it's part of what makes this a really good dramatic uh concept for a tv show so the air force people are close analogs to existing people Major Quinn, or Captain Quinn, who's played yes. by Michael Malarkey in the show, he's actually an amalgamation of several of the Project Blue Book directors, based most closely on Ruppelt, the first Project Blue Book director. And um, recently, I've met twice the last surviving Air Force director of Project Blue Book, Lieutenant Colonel Robert Friend. Mm -hmm. uh, and I went to his 99th birthday party. And this guy is an American hero. In addition to Project Blue Book, he was a Tuskegee Airman who's, who I think flew on 146 combat missions um, and worked on the space shuttle. And my he was my father's favorite. I think he thought that was the best he could ever get. This was a guy who had a genuine curiosity, who had a duty to the Air Force, but also grew to have a very close friendship with my father. And even then, when you had the best luck of the draw, very quickly, they would have divergent purposes. They would start off on a case, and their first job is to determine, is it legitimate? If so, right away, they're going to go different ways. The Air Force guy is going to try to determine, does this pose a risk to national security? Mm -hmm. And that already, my father, that's not the road he's going down. It's more like, 
How can I, how can I prove that this is real? Can I replicate it? How can I communicate it to others? So even with a very sympathetic friend who had um, science in mind, they're always going to be at odds, at odds. And unfortunately, all of the other directors were not quite the same way. And some of them very much, very little interested in science and, you know, very gave short shrift to any kind of professor type. In the series, um, you, I mean, since your dad is the central figure in the series, um, I know artistic license had to be taken across the board. Uh, just, just kind of a quick thought before we start diving into some of the way these uh, particular cases have been treated. How is your family feeling as this is airing right now? Well, my family feels pretty good. And there's, there's a lot of us in the family. We all have somewhat different opinions. But we knew going into this that they were going to do a show about my father, who's a public figure. So with or without us, and when they approached my brother Joel and I to serve as consultants on the show, we had a long, uh, a long family discussion and decided, yes, we should do that, so we have a chance to influence uh, and color the portrayals of my, of my father and my mother, mm -hmm. uh, who grew into an important role in ufology herself. So... Um, in the first season, because my brother and I both have entertainment backgrounds, they let us read the pre-production scripts, I visited the set, and they encouraged us to communicate with Aidan Gillen and Laura Minnell, who play TV mom and TV dad. Um, and so we had a lot of chance to make input, um, and the second season will have more sort of broad-based input, and I'm very happy to say that my mother will become a much stronger character. Oh, interesting. Well, on that note, uh, give us a little bit of a tease because um, how did your mother end up becoming involved herself and have influence in that community? Yeah, so, you know, my father is a figure like in the movie, Close, you know, his, his sort of journey from Blue Book to Close Encounters is somebody that a lot of people can relate to. Here's a nuts and bolts astrophysicist, a little Czech boy from Chicago an ordinary guy in some aspects who gets thrust into extraordinary circumstances who doesn't believe it and then comes to be grudgingly accepted. Okay, that's something that a lot of people who are not interested in UFOs or things like this can go along with the journey and say, okay, well, if this guy went this way, maybe it's okay for me too. My mom is an even more extreme example of that. She's from Northeast Ohio, very grounded, practical Midwestern type, and I think she really helped, and she, you know, she became editor of the International UFO Journal, the International UFO Report, which is the journal put out by the Center for UFO Studies, uh, organized conferences, and became a very vocal figure. And I think even more so helped people who thought this is a bunch of hogwash or it's too scary to really say, well, look, if Mimi Hynek, who is not prone to flights of fancy, is on board with this, then maybe I'll take another look. Yeah, that, that she plays a wonderful role in it. I can't wait to see what they're going to do in season two. Of course, I'm there Tuesday oh. nights. As soon as the thing records, I'm watching it just so I can get past all the commercials, <laughs> like most people. But um, I, yeah, I found it a fascinating journey, and I knew something because I've covered this subject for quite a number of years about Project Blue Book and ultimately the Condon Report and so forth. But it's really good seeing kind of a close-up uh, characterization of the players involved. Um, one of the things I was wondering about, and I think a lot of people do, uh, let's start talking about some of the dramatization and some of the actual, um, you know, uh, kind of brick and mortar parts of the cases that are being portrayed, okay? Because so they are all based on real cases. So we need to put that out first. So first of all, they have this kind of ongoing theme throughout the series uh, about uh, Russian spies and filtrators trying to get close uh, to your mom so that you can gain information from your dad. He's, he's very juicy, you know, very sexy little blonde and so forth. Um, the reality was there was a lot of industrial espionage going on at the time and military espionage, uh, in particular over these subjects, high technology as well, uh, particularly reverse engineered technology back in the day. So we know these things were going on, but were they going on in the case um, of Project Blue Book running alongside your father and mother's life? So you know, that's, that's a good question. And one of the interesting things that the creator of the show, David O'Leary, who's a huge UFO buff, I must say, 
um, he decided to set the show in the 50s because of this really heightened Cold War tension uh, and sort of the lead up to the space race with yeah. fun coming online a few years later, which my father was quite involved with. Um, and so you have this tension and we have that kind of tension now. And as David O'Leary likes to say, he thinks this was the creation of fake news because there's a lot of propaganda put out by the Air Force you know, and you can see that the Air Force has a job to protect us from threats from the sky, but also the perception of threats from the sky. So viewed in that prism, their efforts to discredit and demonize figures in the UFO industry make sense because they want to make it look like, you know, it's the old axiom about the devil makes himself look silly so people don't believe him. Right. So this kind of uh, undercurrent of espionage, like you said, industrial espionage, Absolutely, the Russians were trying to find out what's going on. And a lot of, I think, the cover-up on the part of the U.S. Air Force is maybe not so much because they have an alien body, but because they may have a lead for some kind of propulsion system that they don't want the Russians to get. So they have two worries about disclosure. Sensitive, military, weaponizationable, if that's a word, intelligence to the Russians, but also panic that would cause that would happen in the U in the fabric of U.S. society. So you know nowadays we have a growing consensus that the country or non-nation state that gets a qualitative leap on the others with artificial intelligence is such a huge advantage that we haven't seen in military prowess before. And I think there was a feeling back then that if they could capture a saucer and figure out this propulsion system or meta-dimensional travel or whatever their secrets were, that represented the same kind of fatal killer that they could apply to other countries. So I have to think they were doing things. Probably a little bit more, um, a little bit more slyly than they show yeah. it, I would think. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the way the woman works her way into your mother's life is just kind of so, is such a kind of feminine, slithery character, so to speak. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And, 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 you know, I'd like to say my mom would have rebuffed that entirely from the beginning. But, you know, and also with the show, you actually see in the household and you see these Russian spies. In real right. life, you don't see them. Now, they may be there. I don't feel that any of our neighbors were like that. Right. Uh, I don't know. But um, so the show, you know, actually you see that, whereas in real life you just have to suspect there's something going. Okay, there was a, another shadowy presence, and that was basically the men in black. You know, they keep yes, showing that. Right. Okay, let's talk about that for a moment. Yeah, so my father did uh, mention men in black. I don't know if he coined that term, but he did know of their their presence and their – you know, their efforts, um, both in terms of when he would go to a, a, a sighting location, the witnesses would say, oh, people have already been here, and they would be very scared to continue talking. And they would describe people in, you know, black fedoras and, and black suits. So that is a real phenomena. And I, I'm not exactly sure why in the show we call it men in hats. Right. Uh, very clearly enunciated. Because I, I actually think it would have more resonance to call them men in black. I agree. So, yeah. so like, like we'll probably show with Roswell, here, you know, these are things that have entered the, the cultural zeitgeist, and here's the actual origin story of them. Interesting. In fact, Roswell was the thing I was going to bring up next, because when we're talking about um, industrial spying and so forth and the military-industrial complex, that's certainly one of the better-known cases as yeah. a result of the work of Philip Corso. Um, right. Interestingly, though, uh, Corso's work didn't really begin until the early 1960s. There was a 12, 13-year delay between the crash right. and then parting these pieces out to the, you know, foreign technology department for back engineering through, you know, Bell Labs and other corporations. And so did your father ultimately come in contact with Philip Corso and also with some of the... Um, knowledge about what was happening with these down craft and parting out of technology and such? Did that enter his, his sphere? Well, and that's a good point that you raised that um, there was a delay from when Roswell happened. And really for the public awareness, it wasn't until the 70s 
The oh yeah, way later. Yeah. So uh, I know my father investigated Roswell, uh, and we can ask Paula if if he had interactions with Corso. I have to think he did. Yeah. Uh, I just don't know personally for sure whether yeah. or not. I mean, yeah, I was just, it's kind of a slightly different track. I just thought I'd toss it out there, and I can ask Paolo about that one that one later on. Okay, so here we have the men in black. Did your dad have a feeling about who these um, men in black were? Because they pop up in so many different scenarios. There have been so yeah. many stories about them. Right, I mean, pick your conspiracy theory. Are yeah. they American military or intelligence uh, agency personnel? Are they Russians? Are they aliens? Are they us from the future? You know, it's a very smorgasbord of conspiratorial options for men in black. Right. I think he, he believed that they were U.S. military intelligence related. Um, because for the other categories, I don't think you would be so overt. Um, I think you'd be more sneaky. So, yeah, I think he thought they were from some other agency in the government. And that's one of the things that I like to, to, to mention that, we tend to think of the Air Force and the military and CIA as in lockstep, but there's so many different entities within them. And even yeah. in the CIA, you could have warring factions. Exactly. Or I mean, cross purposes. Yeah, that's very true. And uh, the CIA, NSA, all of these were formed just after Roswell. And, and part of the thought is in response to Roswell right. and starting mm -hmm. to control messaging uh, to the public aside from the other purposes that we know about. And right. so it, right. it would make sense that, um, I mean, I don't know who the men in black are either. I've heard all the conspiracy theories as well. But it would make sense also that they were mm, kind of clandestine members of, of the new, newly formed intelligence services that tried to get out in front of the story before the military even got their hands on it because they're always trying to do that and they're controlling the message still to this day across the board. Right. Every incident that happens has the signature of intelligence um, modeling in it in terms of the message. Right. And it, it could be, you know, it could be a la carte. You could pick some yeah. from intelligence, American intelligence, some from Russians and put them together yeah. in the big men in black salad. <laughs> exactly. Interesting. Okay, now um, I'd like to get into, uh, let's talk about some of what has been dramatized in the show. We already talked about the Russians and the men in black. And let's talk about a couple of the instances in particular. Um, the first one, which is, I think it was called the Fuller Dog Fight. It's is the very yeah. beginning, the very first episode. Yeah. Let's talk about that man and what happened to him, because this theme comes up again later on in another show. Right, so yeah, and that's based on, as, as you know, the Gorman dogfight, and it's renamed the Fuller dogfight yes. in the show, which is a real incident. And each episode starts off with a real incident, and each episode finishes with kind of a bookend of what really happened during that report. Yes. And then interviews with Richard Dolan, and Jacques Vallée, my brother and I, about recollections from my father's point of view. So that case introduces the idea that we also saw in the movie Close Encounters, of some kind of communication, or in this case, mind control, that, that starts at, at, at a sighting. And one of the interesting things in that episode was, uh, in our consulting roles, the showrunner asked us, hey guys, there's a scene in, in episode one where somebody is in North Dakota, and we want them to hear their hometown radio station in San Diego. Now we know that's impossible, so how would your father deal with that? So my brother Joel, who is more electronically inclined than me, said, well, actually, it's not impossible. There are certain atmospheric conditions in which the sound would bounce off and actually traverse that far. So there's a lot of gnashing of teeth on the part of the writers. And then we talked about how my father could just say, you know, because he's an expert. Now, in, in this show and other shows, they tend to make scientists expert at everything science related, everything under the stars, literally. Um, but in this case, we just had him say something. Now, I think the phrase they used was logically that's not possible. Now, I would have preferred, well, I, I've studied the environmental conditions and it's not possible because logic is really not part of this. Right. It's, it's a physics issue, not logic. Right. right, exactly. One of the things that we tried to input is that I've noticed in television movies that uh, writers tend to think of smart scientists 
as kind of robotic and Vulcan and always trotting out logic, um, which is not the case. They're just normal people who focused themselves at a very early age. My father knew he wanted to be an astronomer at the age of seven. So apart from that, you know, my father was a very gregarious, warm man with an over fondness for puns. <laughs> so he wouldn't always say logically that doesn't work. But so that's an example where we help them sort of understand both the physics and how my father would react. What about the pilot himself who felt his plane had been taken over from him, who yeah. lost control completely, who looking at the damage on the aircraft should have been theoretically dead. Now, how did that play in real life? So um, my understanding of the case wasn't that dramatic with that much damage on the plane. Um, but as in, you know, in Hollywood, you amp that stuff up. But he did feel as though he had lost control? Yes. That's the main part that I'm, I'm interested in. Right. Okay, so he did. And this really tweaked him. Yes. You know, mentally, it really tweaked him. Yes. What took control of that craft and why, why am I still here, right? Yes. So, okay, so that's the first episode. People can get into it and kind of watch all the, you know, the intrigue for themselves. Another one was uh, the Flatwoods Monster. And this is one of those where at the end of the show, I thought, gee, I hope they treat this fairly because this woman and her kids with their radiation burns on their face or their bur the burns on their face, right, right. you know, it was very compelling. So tell us a little bit about this one. So, yeah, so this one's interesting. Um, it's one of several episodes, and I, I don't think there are spoiler alerts now because they've, they've already aired, where they found, call it a prosaic or, or conventional explanation. Mm -hmm. and this one they determined, and it was the Project Blue Book determination, that it was a meteor and a large owl. Mm -hmm. Now, the, and as the, as the episode shows in a postscript, the living witnesses don't, they don't accept that. Right. They, they do not accept that it was an owl and a meteor. Right. So this is one of those cases where, okay, the, the blue book, um, and I don't, I don't know the inner workings of the determination of this case as whether it was kind of whitewashing or whether they generally felt that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Interesting. Another one um, I was kind of intrigued with only because I've seen this phenomenon myself and no one has yet to explain it to me. And that is the green fireballs. Yes. I've seen this now two times. One oh. right actually in this house facing in that direction at three o'clock in the morning. And they move very, very rapidly and were literally kind of barely diagonally just crashing down into the ground from the sky in the oh. middle of the night. So I have seen that. And it, and it, they're, they're, it was significant in size. I saw the exact same thing again with my cousin. Um, in Sedona behind Thunder Mountain, you know, and of course, oh. Sedona, there's a lot of lore in Sedona, as you know, about what goes on underground I, and all that. I've spent much time in Sedona. Yes. And so we were at her house one evening and uh, went out at dusk and boom, this huge green fireball, same thing, came just shooting down. I mean, like crashing down from the sky wow. behind Thunder Mountain and we saw it together. So I thought, no, I wasn't crazy the first time. We both saw this. Were there any thoughts on that or did that ever come up or I mean I was intrigued because of my personal experience I know it was treated differently in the show yeah so you know green fireballs um, there's a lot of and there's actually a project twinkle most people don't know about project blue book and project sign and project grudge right but project twinkle was something that was set up to evaluate those and I don't know if, if they've ever come up with plausible explanations for that because that's a really hard thing to describe, especially what you just described. Yeah. Uh, that's obviously not a meteor or meteorite. No. Uh, and so, and these, these various objects, there's a lot of reports of that. So I really don't know. That's something that I find very tantalizing. Looking at where we are today, in, in the world of media, the film industry, television industry, I'm thrilled that Project Blue Book is out there because at least it's an attempt to mm -hmm. tell something somewhat definitive, you know? Um, and this is more than has been done before, in my opinion. Um, so I'm, I'm very proud of the History Network and of all of you for putting this show together so people can get an idea. This isn't child's play and this isn't make, this isn't make believe. It's a real phenomenon and get the public at large comfortable, comfortable with this notion. But here we are now uh, 
you know, another half a century later, and most, more than half a century later, and most of the shows that are coming out uh, really have kind of a, a darker context or more evil, destructive intent. How do you feel about the subject being treated in this way? And what do you think the motivation for that is? If what I said earlier actually is true, and I know um, that Richard Dolan talks about this a lot, he's written a book on it, that we do have intelligence at the top of all of the communication networks, okay? Why this frightful scenario about others, any others, anything that isn't us? I think it sells more tickets. I, I think, that simple. Fear sells. Yeah, you know, I think that um, entertainment, when you, when you read a novel, fiction is about creating an emotional response. Yep. Um, so that perhaps you don't have to live through something horrible, but you can sort of feel that you're, you're there living vicariously through the character's eyes. Yes. Um, and, you know, nobody wants to read a book or watch a movie about the village of the nice, happy people. Uh, so fiction works really well to scare people. And this is something that, that really gets to the deepest of our atavistic fears about existence. Are there other beings out there? And if they've come here, you know, dollars to donuts, they're a whole lot more advanced than we are. So now we're at their complete mercy. Are they benevolent? Are they malevolent? Are they just sort of curious? and don't really care, which is maybe one of the most scary things. They're just indifferent about us, like, like artificial intelligence would be. So I think it's just, if you're writing something, I think you can just sort of latch into those fears that we have of something coming that would have a technology superiority over us akin to ants and humans. Mm -hmm. so I think that's part of it. You know, I, I, I go Occam's razor with a lot of things, the, the thing that seems the most simple. now. Um, is there some type of manipulation of these things? Um, I don't know. I, I like the sort of concept of disclosure that Luis Elizondo from ATIP has, that it's not a discrete event, but an overall process of acclimat acclimatization. And so, um, I, 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 you know, Project Blue Book and also Close Encounters, the other project my father was in, are both more of these benevolent looks at the phenomenon. Um, and I think it's the same thing with people, how they view the singularity. When, when artificial intelligence becomes self-aware and recursively self-improving, will it be an extinction-level event like the Matrix or Terminator, or more like Ray Kurzweil believes, more of a, of a, of a dramatic step in our own evolution? And I think people that, in general, that feel that the singularity and artificial intelligence becoming self-aware it poses a, an existential threat to humanity, would also look at UFOs and aliens in that same color. No, I think you're right. And that, that certainly is uh, the most obvious and the most plausible um, explanation for it. And I can even tell you just on a very personal level from years ago, um, I was a news anchor at the time, and we decided to start a, an afternoon news, you know, the afternoon news. I'd been on the evening news. We were going to do this experimental, a noontime news show that actually included good news. It didn't last long at all. I mean, shockingly, it's, there is an, the notion of something very fine and beautiful and collaborative has a very subtle feel to it. Beauty itself has a very subtle um, almost ethereal kind of quality to it that that is evanescent in nature. So it's here, you feel it, and it's gone. It's not addictive. It's something that you just kind of work, live alongside, work your way into over time, if that's your desire, where fear is very sticky and dense and has a lot of chemicals that shoot out in association with it. And again, the, as you say, this whole notion of fear sells, um, addiction sells, and it, fear is addictive. So I think, I think you're right on that. I mean, I'm kind of, I'm over it. I'm really tired of that kind of thinking and programming of minds so that um, it really stunts people from the curiosity about what's more fine and beautiful. <laughs> but that's personal. I mean, that's why I do what I do, because I, I take that personally. <laughs> so for you, in the end, um, what do you think the value is for the public at large to be aware of, 
um, these cases like Project Blue Book and aware of the work of people like your father and aware of the complexity of the military and industrial complex and governments and competition and espionage, what's the point? What is the good that comes from the, the average person being aware of these things now? That's a great question. Um, you know, um, the show, and I've had a lot of people ask me, how do you feel about this and this portrayal of your family? You know, uh, I think my father, in looking at the show, would put on his slippers, a comfortable robe, have some popcorn, sit in a comfortable chair, and have a grand old time. Yeah. I think my mother would say, oh, that's a bunch of nonsense, and you don't need me in there. Um, the bottom line of the show is that it portrays an honest, curious scientist who's asked via his patriotic duty to, you know, explain away UFOs, thinks he can do it in a weekend's work, and it becomes, you know, a career maker after that. And he goes on this journey from debunker to, as I said, acceptor. And the show shows that very nicely. Everything else is fine details. I mean, just to have that core message that here's a respected scientist who went on this journey and he's going to drag a lot of people along with him, that's the value of the show. And the, in terms of what's the point of the show, things like this, Close Encounters, uh, Project Blue Book, other projects like, or other entertainment vehicles like this, they really help move the needle for the acceptance of, of talking about it and actually reporting things that we have, that people have seen themselves in a way that books and documentaries won't do because most of the books and documentaries operate in an echo chamber of people who already have these beliefs. Now they want to learn more and refine them, but they're not going to convince people to make a larger tent like a work of fiction would do. It's like I think of restaurants uh, I, know, I know of several restaurants in California that used to be solely vegetarian, but the problem they had was they couldn't get groups of six or eight people to come there because one or two of those people wanted meat. So they started serving some meat to try to cater to both of them. So I started, I think a work of fiction like this does is says, look, you know, come for the fun Russian spy craft and Werner von Braun and all these things and stay for the real case reports. And it gets people to to really expand their consciousness and think, okay, there really might be something going on here. Now let me take a look. And you can go to thehistorychannel.com and find out more there, or there are obviously a lot of books and magazines that can help you learn more. So I think the value is getting people to, be, to accept more and discuss more one of the most pressing issues to ever face mankind. Excellent answer. And finally, do you, in your own personal opinion, what do you think it's going to take before the governments actually do start coming forward and releasing documents, more and more documents, and allowing people to see for themselves what's been going on along, uh, on all along? I know you just said that it's kind of being drip fed out through the entertainment industry so we can become accustomed to it. Um, but what do you think the tipping point might end up being in having an actual open and talk about it where the governments are no longer hiding these things from us? Well, that's the $64,000 question. One of the interesting sort of data points in this process is that of the Catholic Church putting out an ecumenical, getting ahead of the issue. So yeah. there is light elsewhere, you know, so they don't want to get caught flat footed. Um, you know, I don't really know. I, you know, I know that the people think that um, there are you know, Lou Elizondo and others will release reports about medals that they have that will, you know, be the smoking gun. Right. I don't think so. I think people will just kind of shrug and say, okay, you've got some weird metal there and your laboratory says it can't be analyzed. Okay. I don't think that will do it. I also don't think videos will do it anymore because now on Facebook, you can create videos that we can't tell are not real. So, if, if it's not going to be medals and it's not going to be videos, I don't know what would it take. I mean, I think it would have to be a live news conference with a gray. I, you know, <laughs> short of that, you know, I think, I think if they're drip dripping, like you said, and getting more and more people to accept it, I think people will be open, but not in their core convinced yet. 
So I think it would take something so dramatic, the landing on the White House lawn, yeah, the yeah. teleportation of the Golden Gate Bridge, something like that, that you just cannot deny it. But short of that, I don't think, I think it's just going to be a continuum as opposed to a discrete juncture or rupture in the current belief system. I agree with you. The, uh, the, no day the earth stood still scenarios uh, yes. in the media offing. However, I have to say that Project Blue Book itself, I think, is making a wonderful contribution toward that end. Because, again, you are taking a very credible person steeped in the world of science who has finally come around to accepting the phenomena, which is beautiful. So when is season two out? I think uh, next Tuesday... Um, which by th this will air just shortly after that. So I think the season is just about over now. So when does season two uh, premiere? Yeah, so I'm very happy that uh, Project Blue Book is now the second highest rated show in cable TV. Yes, I believe that. And yes, yeah, it's, it's done very well. So season two is already under works. The writer's room has been convened. Uh, production will start in June and the new shows will air just like they did this year in early January. Okay, good. Well, we all have that to look forward to. And uh, any final thoughts you have that you'd like to impart before we sign off here? Yeah, sure. Uh, thank you, Regina. I I'd like to say that um, uh, I was Grand Marshal for the March for Science in Los Angeles a couple years ago. And we had 50,000 nerds out there expressing their love of science. And at one point, I stood on top of one of the two electric Humvee vehicles and so I had a great bird's eye view of the whole throng of people. And I saw all the signs, and one of the signs really stood out to me. And that sign said, I'd rather have questions I can't answer than answers I can't question. Yes. And I think what will, what will need to happen for people to really believe more or accept more the UFO phenomena is this comfort in having questions they can't answer. You know, my father, people would ask, is there something to the UFO phenomena? And he said, I'm absolutely convinced there is. Where do they come from? Well, the provenance is really beyond the purview of a scientist because that's so far removed from a Petri dish um, and a laboratory setting. Now, he had his own personal views infused by his Rosicrucian beliefs, but he didn't feel it was appropriate to sort of foist his own personal views onto this but if somebody asked him, what do you think personally, if he knew the people was an informal setting, he would engage in that. But what my, I think what my father would like people to think is that when you're confronted with what might be a new phenomena, open your mind early to the possibility of the new phenomena. And then by the same token, don't close your mind too quickly by simply flailing at and grabbing the best available answer and shoving that in. Perhaps just leave it open and say, I don't know what it is, but it's something. And it's interesting you mentioned your father was a Rosicrucian because he, his mind would be open to actually searching for real knowledge as a result of that. Because through the Rosicrucians, you have so much more cosmological a viewpoint about who humans are, what Earth is, you know, how we function in totality. So that's really lovely that he had that as a... Uh, Kind of as, as a belief system exploration uh, backdrop to his life that allowed his science to be open. Yes, call him a spiritual scientist. Yes, love it. I love it. Well, this has been wonderful, Paul. Um, is there any way anybody can reach you if they wish to? Uh, sure, paulheinick at gmail.com. Okay, very good. Just in case anyone wants to reach out to you with a question. So for now, I thank you so much for taking time while you're there at Paula's house uh, just outside Boulder, Colorado. And um, I very much look forward to seeing what happens in season two. And again, I want to thank you for your contributions and for your family's openness to all of this because I think it does... I think it really offers a very credible piece of the picture uh, to a large number of people. You know, slowly, entertainingly, um, and relatively gently. So again, thank you, Paul. My pleasure, Regina. I enjoyed it. For those of you that didn't see my interview with Paula originally setting this talk up, you can go into the archives here on reginameredith.com to do that. And uh, also my interview uh, recently with Angela Smith. Uh, she is a remote viewer that had the 
interesting experience of being contracted by someone to see if she could reach out and speak with species from other places. And she's a very logical, a very lovely woman who was able to get information about um, the nature of other species and what they're doing interfacing with human beings. So those are in the archive. So for now, I appreciate your time. And until next time, thank you for joining us here on ReginaMeredith.com. Thank you for watching this video. You can find many more like it free of charge by going to reginameredith.com. And if you're finding that this kind of content is adding value to your life, you might want to support my work by clicking on the Patreon button on the website, reginameredith.com. As a patron, you have special videos, insider commentary, and much more. Check it out.